Hey, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming to my talk today. Um, my name is Abdul Basit, and uh, I work as a product architect uh, with uh, Rakutan Symphony. Um, I work with, the, with our customer mostly around uh, uh, Kubernetes networking, uh, service mesh, uh, multi-cluster. And today, I will be talking about uh, one of the multi-cluster uh, out there, which is based uh, of uh, eBPF. It's uh, from a product uh, called Cilium. Um, um, so uh, for those who are um, uh, not much aware of uh, Rakutan, um, Rakutan have multiple um, uh, businesses. Uh, and one of the business is uh, Rakutan uh, Symphony. Uh, and in the Rakutan Symphony, we have uh, multiple product we use. Uh, and one of the product BU is, uh, BU is uh, SimCloud, uh, and I work for that uh, specific BU. And we have um, three verticals. Uh, one is the um, cloud uh, native platform, which is um, Kubernetes uh, uh, distribution uh, optimized for um, high performance uh, networking and storage use cases. And uh, there is a special focus around zero touch deployment. Uh, we have a, um, a highest performance cloud native storage available as well that can run on any Kubernetes distribution or, uh, or on any cloud. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, packaged together with, the, uh, with our cloud native platform. And then we have um, a SIM cloud orchestrator, uh, which is um, an orchestrator for bare metal uh, and service automation provisioning across uh, thousands of clusters, uh, data centers, um, and servers. Um, so yeah, let's go to the Cilium. So um, I believe most of you uh, are uh, aware of this um, Cilium, at least as a CNI. Um, in a brief, um, Cilium um, um, is a CNCF uh, graduated project. Uh, it offers uh, features like um, CNI, load balancing, cluster mesh, uh, security features, um, observability, uh, service mesh. Uh, there are so many things. I wish I could talk more about that. Um, but at the foundation, Cilium utilizes uh, an eBPF, which um, there was an early mention of that as well in the uh, Kepler, I believe the Kepler project, um, which enables somehow a Linux kernel to add enhanced features for uh, security, visibility, and networking. Um, so yeah, just to show you the, the, the amount of feature that uh, Cilium have, if I put them all together in one graph. And today, we are just going to talk about this one small circuit, which is the uh, multi-cluster uh, networking feature of the Cilium. Um, so in a nutshell, um, eBPF um, uh, provide a mechanism to load uh, a programmable hook into the Linux kernel. Which makes, um, uh, which makes the kernel uh, dynamic uh, to act on the events that happen in the kernel. For example, the program here uh, is waiting for an uh, exact call from the process, and then it returns the uh, PID of, the, of that specific process, right? Um, and specifically, we saw earlier in the morning that um, ABPF is used to uh, collect the utilization metrics uh, from the servers as well, the energy utilization metrics. Um, uh, so we can compare you to, uh, the, the best example uh, for eBPF is to compare it with the JavaScript, how JavaScript um, enable us to do uh, or to interact with the browser, uh, how we do the click, for example, right? And then it will uh, invoke dynamically certain amount of scripts. Uh, and that's how uh, today eBPF is powering the Linux kernel uh, to bring many new uh, enhanced feature um, in the kernels that were not possible previously without doing a completely complete uh, rebuild of the kernel itself. Um, when I um, started working, uh, or when my first interaction with the Kubernetes uh, when I was working in a company, um, uh, usually when people start uh, Kubernetes, I mean, I believe most of us start with a single cluster. But for us, even back then, uh, there was a strict, uh, strict requirement uh, that we have to start uh, multi-cluster uh, because the workload has to be um, uh, physically separated from each other. Um, and we end up something like that. Initially, I named this slide as uh, ingress-based ingress multi-cluster, but 
in my opinion, it was uh, deceiving, so I changed it to uh, like uh, ingress-based uh, cross-cluster connect, give it a different name, because it's not really a multi-cluster. Uh, so, but it is simple. Um, that um, what how how it works is that um, uh, to 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 uh, to do multi-cluster, it works the same way as today we use uh, Kubernetes uh, to expose our services out to the internet, right? Or uh, the terminology that we use as uh, as an as a north-south traffic. Um, there is no relationship uh, between the clusters; completely independent. Uh, no service discovery. Um, so if the uh, source in cluster one want to talk to the destination in cluster two, source goes out, makes a service discovery outside the cluster, uh, and then comes in to the second cluster via the ingress. I hope uh, we, we are not using the same ingress for everything, so usually we will be having a private ingress uh, for, uh, for, for, a, for a cross cluster as compared to the one that is exposed outside the internet, to the internet run. And this is usually the starting point that I see with, uh, with most of our customer, right? So this is what uh, sort of like, you know, uh, make them uh, start thinking it's a time to look into something better, to, to do a much better uh, uh, multi-cluster uh, topologies. Uh, and one of them were discussed earlier uh, by Brian as well, uh, with a very good context uh, of what we can do with multi-cluster. Um, so, um, moving forward in today's talk, I will be talking about a service mesh-based multi-cluster. So it is like creating a single logical clusters of multiple single clusters, and these clusters can be um, in multi spread across multiple clouds, multiple data centers. Um, um, so even if you look in the in the in the diagram, um, the services are global, right, and the endpoints are global as well. So for example, a source in cluster one um, uh, wants to do the service discovery, it does the discovery in a cluster one. Um, and similarly, if a source in cluster two wants to do the service discovery for the app one, which is a destination in this case, it does the service discovery within a cluster two as well. And the endpoints are uh, global, and that uh, makes us to do very, very interesting uh, sort of routing policies on it, right? Um, some of it, some of uh, which I will try to explain uh, in a bit as well. Um, so yeah, it support um, complex use cases, for example, uh, federated identity, uh, global routing, uh, and multi-cloud deployment. So uh, some of the use cases um, uh, of the service mesh based multi-cluster, uh, we have uh, uh, global services um, across multiple cloud uh, providers, um, and uh, we can have uh, a very good availability for those services. For example, um, a service can fail uh, from one cloud to another cloud. Um, we can have a better utilization in uh, failovers. Um, in fact, the, uh, the better uh, utilization use case is what um, I'm discussing with one of the customer at the moment. So today, the way the, they, they have done the architecture is that um, um, the whole app stack is deployed in uh, one data center, um, and that is the active app. So they don't have like the component or service level failover. Uh, so all the request is coming to one data center and being served from uh, served from that data center, and the other data center is completely idle, right, doing nothing. Um, we can do locality aware routing. Uh, that was discussed uh, as well earlier uh, uh, early, earlier in the brand talk, right? So um, uh, when we have a global endpoints. Uh, what we can do is that we can do a smart routing, right? So if the request is originating from within a cluster one, we can uh, have a policy that, okay, the request goes to the cluster one, for, to the endpoints in cluster one, uh, or maybe cloud one, right? But if it is coming, originating from a, a different cloud or different cluster, it goes to the, to the uh, being served from the, from the other cluster. Uh, we can use security and global policies in a much better ways uh, because we know the identity of all the endpoints, so we can enforce policies, and also we can have a much better observabilities uh, based on that. Uh, so um, let's just take an example. For example, if I want to uh, uh, um, do the uh, service mesh based multi cluster, what do I need to do? Uh, this is, by the way, not specific to um, Cilium cluster mesh. It is a generic that I have seen across. Uh, any other service mesh based multi cluster topologies as well. Uh, so at minimum, we need at least two requirements that has to be there, for example, the cross cluster service discovery and the network connectivity and load balancing, right? So um, if I have a source in cluster one, 
um, and a destination in cluster 2. Um, if source talk to the uh, local QBPI server, for example, and try to ask about the destination, um, it, will, the, uh, it will not get any answer for that, right? So in that case, uh, what we have is that we have an additional um, uh, controller um, that sits in the cluster, and it goes and talk to the QBPI of a second uh, cluster, uh, uh, get the endpoints of that cluster, and then inform the source somehow. Uh, let's not talk about the detail. Um, that, hey, okay, uh, the global endpoints of the second clusters are accessible. Uh, and once we have the service discovery, we need the networking part to connect uh, the source and destination. Um, and that's how then we are able to talk, uh, make, make the service uh, multi-cluster work. Um, these two requirements at minimum are good enough for some people, but I know for majority of us, we need more than just uh, cross-cluster service discovery and uh, network connectivity. Uh, so there are important add-ons that are required. For example, we need um, uh, monitoring and observability across multiple clusters. Um, we need encryption. Um, uh, in many cases, access control is mandatory. Uh, and we also need advanced uh, uh, traffic management uh, for, uh, for multi-cluster use cases. Uh, so um, one of the best things that um, Cilium uh, Cluster Mesh offer is that um, if the previous slide, whatever requirement that I discussed, is all available within one product, right? So you don't really need uh, multiple product to make it work. Um, Cilium being a CNI, um, we know Kubernetes, doesn't, uh, Kubernetes networking doesn't work without CNI anyway. A CNI provides us the uh, connectivity, and since uh, Cilium uh, cluster mesh is, uh, um, Cilium is aware of multi-cluster with the cluster mesh uh, feature, um, it is sort of aware of the routing across multiple clusters as well. Um, uh, the, the identity information is shared between multiple cluster. Um, uh, there is a service discovery uh, and lo uh, load balancing built in within a Cilium cluster mesh. Um, and now um, Cilium is also um, adding up a lot of uh, service mesh features as well within the product. So let's look at an architecture which is uh, very specific to the, uh, to the Cilium. Uh, so if you look um, at uh, a cluster one on the left and uh, uh, cluster two on the right, we can see that a uh, few components, right? So there is an agent that runs in every node of the cluster. The job, the job of the agent is to, um, to, you know, to talk to the local Kubernetes API, find out, uh, discover the endpoints, uh, network policies, and uh, it also manages the eBPF maps uh, on the node itself, um, and also attach those eBPF maps to the specific sources in destination. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a cluster mesh API server. You can consider this as like uh, an agent, which is per cluster. So, uh, uh, and the job of this agent uh, cluster mesh API server is that uh, it is that middleman to share information from one cluster to another cluster, right? So, um, for example, um, the agent in cluster one uh, reads um, all the information, for example, deployment, identities, network policies uh, of the cluster mesh of a second cluster. And since the cluster mesh uh, uh, in a second cluster is local in a second cluster, uh, it uh, can talk to the API, local API server and get all the information and then share it over to the first cluster. Right? So uh, because of all this information that is shared uh, between, uh, that is available to the agent, we can see that uh, it makes it possible uh, um, uh, for, for uh, the service discovery uh, and also um, network policies uh, and the identity information that is shared that can be used to enforce. And similarly, uh, the observability data as well, right? That is, you, um, yeah, that is collected um, based on that identity sharing as well between multiple clusters. Uh, so uh, to make um, uh, cluster mesh work, um, there are specific requirements. Uh, so uh, all the clusters uh, have to be in the same uh, data path mode. Um, uh, data, by data path mode, I mean, um, so Cilium supports uh, two types of data mode, uh, data path mode. One is the uh, native routed data path mode, and another one is the tunnel mode. Uh, so all the clusters uh, either have to be in the tunnel mode uh, or it has to be in the native mode. So I believe uh, those who are uh, using um, 
uh, the cloud-based deployment are most likely going to work with the, with the native routed mode. Um, all the nodes uh, must be reachable. Uh, port siders in all cluster must be non-conflicting. Um, that's why in the um, uh, demo I'm using IPv6, in fact, because um, I know the pain of uh, getting dedicated um, port siders for every cluster, especially if you also have to make it routed. Uh, it causes a lot of problems. Uh, I mean, not really a problem, but it's very, very difficult uh, to, to, to achieve that, especially if you have a lot of clusters, right? So yeah, uh, something that uh, you guys can consider to opt in for IPv6, it works pretty well. Um, uh, so yeah, the uh, 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 firewall uh, ports that are required for inter-cluster traffic has to be allowed. Uh, the cluster's names uh, must be unique. Um, there is a specific requirement for the, for the native data path mode is that um, all ports must have a native connectivity between, uh, between uh, each other. So uh, today if you're using um, VMs, it's pretty much similar to like that, that if you look into, the, uh, look into your VPC, you should be able to see uh, all port IPs same as your v, uh, um, VMs IP addresses as well. So in demo, um, uh, I have two client clusters, um, and uh, there are IPv6 uh, unique side ranges for uh, cluster one uh, and cluster two. Um, and um, for native routing, um, I'm using an open source FRR router. Uh, consider this as uh, uh, maybe your VPC that uh, provide you BGP capabilities to do the peering. So the reason of picking FRR is for me so that I can uh, peer my uh, multi uh, um, each cluster with the FRR uh, to make uh, the native routing work. And then um, I have a cluster mesh um, deployed in cluster one and cluster two. And these cluster mesh API servers are uh, exposed via Metal LB. And um, we will look into the use case of, first use case of doing the uh, multi-cluster um, um, east-west traffic, right? So uh, for example, uh, the sleep, uh, I have a, a hello world deployment uh, in cluster one, which is having a version v1, and a hello world um, deployment uh, in cluster two with a version v2. Uh, when I make a call uh, uh, from a sleep pod in uh, cluster one, uh, it should be able to talk to the uh, Hello World V1 and Hello World V2 in both clusters. Let me try to do that. Yes. Looks good. So if um, I have Ilyas as K1 for cluster 1 and K2 for cluster 2, uh, get nodes, I believe. So much delay, okay. So I have two clusters and uh, maybe I should have used, uh, okay, and then um, within, let's look into the cluster one, we get uh, cube system. I have everything done uh, already in advance. Um, you can see the, um, uh, uh, Cilium, you can see um, uh, Cilium Mesh uh, API server, um, that is the, uh, the Cluster Mesh API server. You can see the Hubble uh, for uh, observability. And then I have, uh, uh, in the default namespace, I have uh, V1 pod in Cluster 1 and, sorry. Okay, so uh, V2 in cluster two, sorry for the lag, this demo is, I'm accessing over the VPN. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's try to verify the east-west traffic, okay? So I have a script for that. What I will do is, uh, we'll just go to that script. 
is in the app folder and okay so it is verify east west okay Okay, so um, uh, we can see the uh, in the beginning some of the information. For example, the uh, uh, the just just the uh, node IP addresses uh, for each cluster, and then uh, to show you the uh, pod um, pod sidars uh, from within the local cluster uh, that are known to every node in a cluster. So these are this is just from one of the node. And then it also knows about the uh, port sidars of the second cluster uh, uh, cluster node. That's mandatory. Uh, and then we have, um, um, yeah, so cut from cluster one. Um, we can see that it can access uh, the local service and it does the load balancing between cluster one and cluster two. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, the important uh, uh, thing to remember here is that if I do the, um, for example, the endpoint. So uh, we can see that um, Hello World has um, only a local endpoint, right? Um, so the cluster one by itself, QBPI of the local server is not aware of the second endpoint. Um, it happens actually in the, um, uh, ABPF, right? So the request comes, um, uh, and within the ABPF data path mode, this load balancing is happening. If I have time later, I'll try to show you that as well. Uh, to, to, to look into the CDM agent, and then we can get the information out uh, about the endpoint that it is aware of. Uh, um, so that was the traffic flow between uh, uh, east-west uh, cluster. I will also try to show you guys um, the traffic flow for the north-south traffic. So let's see what happens when the traffic is coming from the internet, right? So, um, so what we can see when the traffic is coming from the outside, uh, in fact, um, let me see. I can show you guys the slides again. Okay. So for the north-south traffic, I have an Istio ingress that I'm using for the north-south traffic and expose the Hello World service on the Istio ingress. Um, so the request comes and hit the Istio ingress and then it goes to the, uh, to the Hello World, right? Um, what I'm seeing here is that um, We can only see the version one, right? So um, we don't see the version two. Uh, and the reason it's happening is if I look into the Istio uh, endpoint, um, I can only see the local endpoint, right? So th that's how it works. It's um, um, uh, Istio uses a client side load balancing. It does its own service discovery and asks the Kubernetes uh, server for, for the local endpoint. Uh, and, um, and then it uses that uh, to, to, to send the traffic. So Istio is, ingress is not aware, and it is, it is a common issue. Even if you use Nginx, you will see more or less the same behavior. Um, um, I will just show you the trick, uh, how to make it work with Istio. Uh, I believe there are uh, other mechanism for other specific load balancers. So what I'm gonna do is I will just try to tell Istio to, uh, to use the cluster IP instead of going directly straight to the endpoint. But I hope it works because the, um, Response is pretty slow. Get SE. So I, I have deployed um, a service entry um, in a local cluster, um, and I call it a hello world dot global. And that service entry responds to the uh, cluster IP in a. Um, um, uh, oops, sorry. Respond to the uh, uh, hello world cluster IP service and. Um, what I will do is, okay. I'll just go and edit the hello world vs. So instead of going to the, uh, 
directly to the uh, um, hello world ser uh, service. I will tell it to go to the hello world global. And then let's try to verify again. Hopefully it works. <coughs> no. No, it, it, it does work. So um, we, we can see the uh, V2. Uh, and also this uh, endpoint IP has changed. So OK, one get. Um, Uh, hello world, D6. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's uh, it from the demo. Let me check. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, we still have uh, three plus minutes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>